So I want to share some personal stories of regeneration and rethinking. And I guess these are stories that show, I think, a range of uh, illustration, uh, illustrative stories that range from so much are more business focused to some which are more personal, and some stories which are more uh, small and everyday, and I think some which perhaps a little bit more profound. Uh, before I start to talk about some of my stories there, I think it's worthwhile just saying a, a few words about regeneration, and I think. Um, I have a personal perspective about the power of regeneration and uh, really how I think about those people who are involved in regeneration and rethinking. And I, I guess what I'd begin by saying is that possibly there are three kinds of people in the world. And I guess the first kind of person um, is someone who wants to create. And I guess it's very seductive to think about building your dream house in the country. And uh, all of us, especially many of you in the audience, I'm sure, uh, will be very keen on starting your, your kind of cool new startup in Shoreditch. What's the new kind of the new Instagram? And yet, actually, building your, your dream house on a greenfield site is possibly the easiest thing you can do, far less of a challenge than, for example, renovating an old industrial building. A startup born naked and unencumbered is somewhat less of a, of a challenge than a business turnaround. And I just wonder if the cult of creativity, in fact, just leads to more clutter. And maybe we'd all be better served by trying to make better use of what exists already. Possibly there's a, a second kind of person in the world, those who want to manage, to be a, a manager. And I know how corrupting it can be to be able to call your parents and say, hey, I was managing director before I was 30 or CEO before I was 35. The siren call of the corner office is indeed very attractive. I was a Accenture partner for seven years, and indeed I did have a very attractive corner office. But I just wonder if getting excited by the hundreds or thousands of people that work for you is more about vanity and power than it is actually about wanting to do something useful. And then there is the third kind of person, the kind of person who wants to regenerate and to rethink. And these are the kinds of people that I've always admired. And I guess the kind of person that I've always aspired to. It's just that, unfortunately, I've been uh, seduced along the way by the startups and, uh, and by the lure of the corner office. But I think certainly those people involved in rethinking generation are those people who I admire, because I know that it's far more difficult than it is to start with a clean sheet of paper. OK, so my first story concerns regeneration. And it's a story about business regeneration. But I think it has a broader lesson that applies to your personal life as well. And my story begins about 10 years ago, one drizzly November night here in London, when I decided it was a good idea to buy a nightclub. And um, to be honest, it was a fairly sketchy place in Gerrard Street in uh, London Soho in Chinatown. It's the kind of place that we had bouncers to keep people in rather than keep them out. <laughs> Actually, no one laughed at rehearsal yesterday, so I'm doing better. Um, and um, it, in essence, it, it was a fun thing to do, a great experience. But what we were finding is the business was losing huge amounts of money. Uh, and we needed to find a way of turning the business around pretty rapidly. And uh, what we realized was that here in, in Soho, in London, pretty much no matter what you did on a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, you couldn't fail to make money. The bar would just be packed. Equally, on a Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, no matter what we did, we couldn't get people in. The bar would not fill up. There was no elasticity in the market that no matter what we tried, we couldn't make money. But the one day of the week where we could do something and make a difference was a Wednesday. So we did one simple thing to regenerate the bar, regenerate the, the business, which was we swapped the most popular promoter from a Saturday night to the Wednesday night. So we had been thinking the obvious that on a Saturday night, which we were most busy, we'd have uh, our kind of most popular club promoter, Detroit Hard House, or whatever it was. And, uh, and we kind of wrongly assumed that that was the kind of right night to have uh, the most popular promoter. But what we found was that actually, it didn't matter who we had on Saturday, I could have DJed, and it would have made no difference. Um, well, it probably would. Um, but um, so we swapped uh, the, uh, the promoter to the Wednesday night. 
And pretty much instantly, our, our business generated about 25% more revenue over the week. And like most things in business, it was a marginal difference that transformed us from losing money to profitability. And this marginal difference meant that we could then spend more money on redecorating, uh, you know, new furnishings, new bar, and we were able to sell the bar two years later, um, reasonably profitably. And for those interested, uh, the club was called The Clinic in Gerrard Street, and it's now a home to the Experimental Cocktail Club, uh, recently ranked by Condé Nast Traveller as one of the top 10 coolest bars in the world. Um, I also was reminded of this idea of um, regeneration not necessarily being the same as transformation whilst watching Doctor Who the other day. Now, I know we have a lot of non-Brits uh, in the audience, um, but uh, Doctor Who uh, is a time traveller who goes through periodic transformations when the actor concerned decides to go and get a, a different job. And his transformation is told as a complete morphing of the, of the character. And I think sometimes we think of, of regeneration in the same way. We've got to tear down the house to rebuild a new one. In a business, we've got to renovate every single aspect of the business to be successful. And that simply isn't true. Changing one small thing can have immense leverage on a business. And I don't think you need to bore the ocean to achieve a regeneration or a transformation. And this idea of one small thing mattering came back to me last year when I was doing quite a lot of work with Six Sigma Academy, uh, the folks who invented the whole Six Sigma process uh, discipline. And we were doing a lot of work with private equity houses, uh, with the operations teams there. And uh, what we found over successive projects that actually trying to bore the ocean and do too many things at once was counterproductive. Not only do people have no time, no money to do all of these things, but moreover, it was actually damaging to change too many things at once. And what we found to be successful in terms of operations was changing one small thing that had massive transformational leverage on the business. Ken here is um, my uh, co-investor and business partner um, in uh, a business. But in his day job, he's a kind of veteran private equity guy, most recently as a partner at Line Capital. And uh, he also points to this idea of one or two key transform transformational levers being important in business, as opposed to trying to find you know, a whole bunch of things to change at the same time. And indeed, as I said, changing too many things at once is actually counterproductive. I would also extend this idea of one small thing having transformational leverage to your personal life. And as I think about personal relationships, again, I think it's not necessarily what you do every single day that matters. It's what you do on key occasions in that relationship when there is the opportunity for a moment of truth, an opportunity to have a small moment of transformational leverage. For example, Maybe there's a few hours on a Friday night at the end of a working week when the expectations of that encounter are high. How you perform in that encounter can determine the success or failure of that relationship. It's not necessarily what happens every single day. It's what happens birthday, a holiday, anniversary, a key event in that relationship. So whether it's in your personal life or in business, I think the idea of regeneration is not necessarily about what happens all of the time, but identifying a key point of leverage to that relationship or key point of leverage in the business. So my second story is about renewing a business. Um, it's a business story again, but I think again has wider implications for your personal life. So I want to talk about a business called MoFilm. So MoFilm is a business where I was managing director for a while. I still sit on the board, and I'm still uh, an investor there. And to put it very simply, uh, MoFilm is a crowdsourced advertising agency. We run um, competitions in partnership with movie festivals around the world, about 20 different movie festivals, working with big brands like Coca-Cola, Unilever, Chevrolet, to make short films or ads. So for example, this year for Chevrolet, we made their uh, Super Bowl ad. Uh, which was shown during the Super Bowl. At the end of the uh, Super Bowl, as the Americans in the room certainly know, uh, there's a variety of polls taken in terms of people's favorite ad. Uh, our Super Bowl ad for Chevrolet was uh, voted 10th out of 40 ads. So bearing in mind, this was crowdsourced from a competition of filmmakers uh, submitting ready-made films into a competition. We felt that was quite, um, quite an achievement. 
So we partner with these, these movie festivals, uh, Tribeca in New York, London Film Festival, Rome. And typically we have four or five brands coming into that festival, um, each with a brief to make a short film or, or, or an advert that will be eventually shown on TV. And amazingly, we would have typically about 100 one-minute films submitted. It's absolutely amazing the lengths to which our filmmakers will go to support us. Now, what was interesting is that we scoffed at Madison Avenue, these bloated, uh, fat uh, advertising agencies of Madison Avenue with their layers of account management and kind of new business people and two martini lunches and their somewhat uh, dubious ways of winning new business. And yet, we felt that to be a successful crowdsourced advertising agency, a 21st century advertising agency, we had to copy much of what they had. We felt we had to copy their uh, new business generation process, their emphasis on client service, their big client events. And nothing really grew in our business apart from our waistlines. And what we realized is that we were thinking about this all wrong. And we transferred all of our resources from being focused on our clients, perhaps it was a risk. We focused all the resources on our filmmakers. We created these amazing filmmaker events, partnered with movie festivals around the world to give our filmmakers a unique experience to meet with um, uh, leading directors, leading screenplay writers, and actually have an experience they couldn't have had without partnering with MoFilm. We changed our website to be filmmaker-centric as opposed to be brand-centric. We diverted a lot of resources away from account management to have people who could partner with the filmmakers. We paid filmmakers grants um, so they could actually stay working for us as opposed to having to take day jobs. And the impact on our business was absolutely transformational. Uh, we'll be at about a $10 million business this year in terms of turnover. Uh, we're working with amazing brands and producing uh, amazing films. And um, I think um, you know, what this shows is that the idea of uh, focusing on who you think is your audience isn't necessarily the right way of thinking. And what we uh, thought uh, was the right thing in terms of focusing on uh, our clients was, in fact, the wrong thing to do. And by focusing on filmmakers, we, in the end, became far more successful and won more clients than had we focused on our clients in the first place. So this idea of rethinking how do you get to your end goal, not necessarily by the direct route, I think was a very interesting lesson in renewing our business, but I think also an interesting lesson in your personal life as well. Um, my, my third story is a little bit more personal, and it's about rethinking. And uh, something happened in my life about four years ago that made me um, quite extensively rethink my view of my career, um, my view of my personal relationships, and most especially my view about money. Uh, and, and the story is this. Um, in 2008, um, a remarkable young man called Sean Williams was traveling through Africa. And he was in Malawi, and he came across um, a village called Tiziwain. And Tiziwain, unfortunately, it was not such a nice place as it sounds. Um, it was uh, a village in a part of Malawi uh, dreadfully affected by uh, famine, uh, civil unrest, and disease. And uh, in Tiziwain, there were about 100 orphans being looked after by the villagers as best they could. But these 100 orphans were being fed at best two or three times a week. Not two or three times a day, but two or three times a week. And of course, they were dying. Um, and so um, based on that experience, a, a, a small charity called Third World Hope was born, uh, which I'm, I'm very pleased to support. And how uh, Third World Hope works is that each year, uh, a new orphan center is, is built. So far, we have two in Malawi. And um, each of these orphan centers is a self-sufficient chicken farm. And the chicken farm creates sufficient income to pay for the upkeep of the children. It pays for their carers and also pays the salaries of some uh, farm hands uh, as well. And um, we um, were... Um, able, I think, in, uh, in some ways to obviously um, regenerate the village. And that in itself is an interesting story 
of um, how the income from the, the uh, orphan centre actually went into the village itself and in some ways kind of had a regenerative power. But I think the more interesting story um, is this, that um, we realised the cost of saving a life was $65. If you took the cost of building the orphanage, the cost of the chickens to begin with, the cost of setting this up, you make some assumptions about the generations of children that will be supported by the orphanage, it's just $65. And once you know the difference between life and death is $65, then um, that has a pretty profound implication in how you live your life. Now, I think I'm a pretty good person. I, I support um, Third, World War, Third World Hope reasonably, uh, reasonably well, but I always draw the line. At some point, I decide I stop giving money and instead I spend money on sports cars or watches or ski holidays. And this idea of having this currency that you judge other things in your life by has haunted me ever since, but I think in a good way in that it's a profound way of thinking about your life. Um, and so this $65 currency can be very useful in terms of thinking about other things you spend your money on. Every time you go to a restaurant and buy a fancy bottle of wine, it's a trade-off against effectively saving the life of 20 children. And that's a kind of tough thing to always have in your mind in terms of when you think about um, the decisions that you make, the choices you make in your life. Now, we could react to that. Uh, we could ask the audience kind of what you think about that. I'm not going to do that, don't worry. Um, what I would say is that reacting has um, a couple of meanings. And one meaning of uh, a reaction is obviously two things reacting together to create something more powerful, two compounds reacting together. And I think in terms of um, a juxtaposition between two ideas, um, it can be very powerful to think of these ideas working together. And um, one idea uh, that I think is very useful is to think about the cost of saving a life versus the cost of taking a life as a way of communicating the power of um, basically um, the, the low cost that really $65 is in terms of saving a human life. So actually, first, first question, are there any arms dealers in the room? Hands up. I only ask because in the alumni numbers from uh, LBS 2011, I did notice that two people did go and indeed go and work in the defense industry. So, uh, Obviously, they're worried about the bad PR for bankers that year. <laughs> so um, if we uh, just have a, 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 a kind of pause for thought about that, um, maybe we can think about the arms trade compared to the cost of saving lives. The uh, global arms export business, that is the uh, intra-country trade in arms, is worth about $80 billion a year, up 24% last year. The, the Arab Spring was very good business for the arms dealers. Um, there's about 30,000 conflict deaths a year. If you divide $80 billion by 30,000 conflict deaths, the cost per death is about $2.7 billion. If we assume the arms dealers make um, a, a gross margin of around 25%, that's around $660,000 per death, which is 10 times the cost of saving a life. And uh, this is when the story gets a little bit more personal. Um, I was lucky enough um, a couple of years ago to start working with the United Nations, uh, met with Ban Ki-moon, and uh, we were able to talk about different ways of communicating the UN's Millennium Development Goals. And I don't know how familiar everyone is with the, um, the UN's MDGs, but number one of those is the elimination of world hunger. And we were talking with them about finding better ways of communicating um, the idea of the relatively low cost of eliminating world hunger, which is $30 billion. It's not a huge sum. And bizarrely, the United Nations is, in fact, very averse to making political statements, a bit like kind of doctor not wanting to talk about medicine. And what we found was that um, working with the United Nations, we actually could convince them to make this juxtaposition between military spending and the low cost of saving human life. And uh, over a course of time, we met quite a few times with the UN, and then we were able to get uh, Ban Ki-moon, the UN Secretary General, to make this statement uh, last year in a speech to the UN General Assembly, um, where we were able to say that compact, contrasting uh, $30 billion of, uh, of, uh, of, of cost to basically eliminate world hunger is relatively modest compared to the $1.2 trillion 
of, uh, of global uh, military spending. So this was, I think, quite an achievement in terms of what we, uh, what we set out to do.